Well, good evening everyone. Um, tonight's event is, is centered around the topic of gluten and I'll give you a little background on myself. I've been gluten free for four years. My wife is gluten free for four years and we have a three year old who's also been gluten free for since the beginning. The reason why we're gluten free in my household is that upon further study of what gluten is and for, for our own health reasons, we chose to eliminate that from our diet. And it was a, it was a trade off because going gluten free is not something that the people who own Carl's Jr. and McDonald's make very easy for you. It's a challenge, okay? It takes extra work, it's a learning process, but like all things, out of that hard work, something good comes from that. And it's about lowering the inflammation in your body and improving your digestion and how those two simple things will benefit every cellular process in your whole body. So today's talk is all about gluten and I'm going to start this topic today with a video that I think does a really good job of capturing the current state of the gluten craze in our country. People are very interested in food nowadays. People who don't even cook watch cooking shows and everyone has an opinion on what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Lately, I don't know if it's just here in LA, but people are very anti-gluten, which bothers me because I'm very pro-pizza and you can't be <laughs> pro-pizza and anti-gluten. So uh, now some people can't eat gluten for medical reasons, which that I get, I, it annoys me, but I get it. But a lot of people here don't eat gluten because like uh, someone in their yoga class told them not to. <laughs> I keep asking people about this, and I started to wonder how many of these people even know what gluten is. So we decided to find out. Gluten, in case you didn't know, and I didn't know this, is a mixture of two proteins found in wheat and some other natural grains. But here in LA, it's comparable to Satanism. It's, it's... <laughs> so we sent a camera crew out to a popular exercise spot right up the street from us to ask people who are gluten-free a simple question. What is gluten? What is this thing you will not eat? So we're gonna meet a person that doesn't eat gluten and together we're gonna guess if they know what gluten is. Are you ready? Yes! Yeah. Uh, what else do you have to do? Right, let's begin. Do you maintain a gluten-free diet? I do indeed. And what is gluten? Okay, does he know what gluten is? No! Oh, everyone says no. Well, as far as for me, how, how it affects my body, uh, but what, but what is gluten? Oh, that, this is pretty sad, because I don't know. <laughs> Row for one. But I hate it, and I know. Next. Do you maintain a gluten-free diet? I do. What is gluten? All right, does, does this shirtless gentleman know it? Yes, okay. Uh, gluten's in bread. It's a flour derivative, wheat, things like that. <laughs> it's a flour derivative? Right. Like a bre it's like bread, things like that, pastries. It's in those things. Yeah, it's in those things. But what is it exactly? Gluten is a, it's like a grain, right? I like when he coughed. It's like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have some <laughs> in my throat. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All right, next. Do you maintain a gluten-free diet? Yeah, I try to the, to the best of my ability, yeah. What is gluten? Does she know what gluten is? No. Oh. Um, it's the wheat in uh, products such as like bread or pastas, um, rice. Why do you avoid it? It makes you fat. <laughs> I mean, I, like I said, I, don't, I'm, I haven't researched it to the fullest. Um, I have a girlfriend from Russia. She actually just got me into it. So she's reading a book about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Russians, the Russians know about uh, Putin and Putin. They know about both of those things. All right, we have one more. Do you maintain a gluten-free diet? I do. I, I actually uh, don't eat rye, wheat, oat, bran, dairy, nuts, or eggs. Wow. What is gluten? Does he know, does this, does Jewish John Hamm know <laughs> what gluten is? Uh, it is a uh, part, I believe, of the wheat that... Uh, I really don't know. It's in <laughs> rye, wheat, oat, and bran. So that's what I said. I gotta go pick my kids up. Leave me alone. Maybe gluten doesn't exist. 
Okay, by the end of tonight, by the end of tonight, you will all know the answer to that question. So when someone puts a microphone in front of you and asks you, what is gluten, you will be able to tell them. All right, let's get back into what gluten is. So before I go in more into gluten, I just, I, I, I'm always looking at news articles coming out about how our healthcare system is working because we're all here tonight because it doesn't work that great. That's my, that's my assumption. And I go to work every day to help people figure out how to get healthy despite uh, the system that we have. Now I'm not saying I want to live where we don't have emergency medical care. We're very good at that. But managing these chronic issues, we, we fall short. And that's not just my opinion. This is, produce, this is a report that came out a couple weeks ago from a think tank called the Commonwealth Fund. And they ranked countries in the world, rich countries, on their health care. We're dead last. So you can see we're at the very bottom of this chart on overall health care. And this is sort of the environment that we all are trying to navigate. We're trying to figure out how to be healthy in a system that's really not that great. And coming into places like this to get educated is the key to figuring it out because it's all about information. So there's a lot of GMO products on our shelves, not in this store, but in stores all across our country. And this was a study in France that basically showed they gave these uh, lab animals GMO corn, and that's the kind of tumors and cancers that they developed breast tumors, liver, kidney damage, multiple organs, okay? So all GMO is, is a sneaky trick to create this plant that you can spray a very expensive poison on and it won't die. And when you do that to living things, whatever you're spraying gets the poison on it and then when you turn that into food, the poison's in the food. So one, just one, of the, one small benefit of being someone who doesn't eat gluten, if, it's the only, if this is the only reason you did it for, you would not be exposing yourself to Roundup. Not nearly as much. Um, okay, so we have the United Nations putting out reports saying that the way we fix agriculture and feed everyone is we go organic. It's the only way to prevent the production of like super weeds and super bugs. So in a way, by going gluten free, I mean you're not buying the products from the GMO industry because most, even, okay, so there's organic wheat, but most, most gluten in our society is GMO, okay? So even the, the United Nations has picked up on this and said, look, if we want to feed the world, the way we do it is we go, we go with organic agriculture. The idea that you just you know, have 100,000 square miles of corn and everything gets sprayed with the same herbicide and everybody eats the same food doesn't really solve the problem. So it's the diversity of crops. It's help, good for the soil. It's good for us. So first things first, when we talk about gluten, so you know, Jimmy Kimmel goes out and finds a whole bunch of people who, who are just experiencing the benefits of going gluten-free, but they don't really know why. Some of the people he interviewed were like, oh, yeah, I feel a lot better, but like, that's not our question. The question is why, what is gluten? Well, understanding what gluten is gives you more information, and then you'll, you'll, you'll understand more what the why is. So gluten is, all gluten is, is a protein in wheat, barley, rye, trichocal, and spelt. It's just a protein in the seed. No more, no less. It allows the seed to live through the winter. So when you hear about hard Canadian wheat, that's the, that's the expensive wheat, the high gluten flour. Well, hard Canadian wheat is grown in Canada where it gets a lot colder during the winter, and the more colder the winter, the more gluten is in the flour. The gluten allows the flour seed to survive the winter. But we don't eat grass. We're not ruminant animals. We're at the top of the food chain. We eat other animals that eat grass. They eat grass, get all the nutrition from grass, 
goes into their liver, into their muscles, into the other parts of their body, and if we eat that animal, we get all those vitamins in our body. That's how they go up the food chain. But gluten is a grass. We don't break down grass very well. And that's why it's in Elmer's glue, because it's also very sticky. So if you start reading labels, you're going to start realizing that gluten is very much permeates our food supply. I'm not a, I'm not a chemical engineer, I'm not a food scientist, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they look at things like gluten and they think of all the amazing, wonderful products they can make with it. Because it's, it allows products to be shaped and preserved and, you know, it, it's also a stabilizer. So when you go into a grocery store, the, the advice I got when I was in chiropractic college was stay on the outside of the store. That's where the fresh meat and the fresh fruits and the fresh vegetables and the nuts and seeds are. Okay, That's the food that actually helps you stay healthy. On the inside of the store, in any given grocery store in America today, it's probably 80% made out of corn or soy or wheat. Even the packaging, even the glue, even the ink on the outside of the cereal box is made with one of those three items. So we're turning food into industrial products and in the process our food, the quality of our food goes down. But these are the main places where gluten comes into our diet. People who love beer, I'm really sorry. A good IPA is, is, is a wonderful flavor, but it's a gluten bomb. Okay, the malt that they use to make that beer with creates is where the gluten comes from. But you can make gluten-free beer because the hops has no gluten, uh, the yeast has no gluten. You just have to feed the yeast some sugar source so they can do it with other grains, sorghum and uh, other, other, types of other types of grains. So, you know, when I first started looking at gluten, it, it didn't really occur to me how, how many different places it is. We recently discovered that soy sauce by weight is 60% gluten. So it's like a bartender at a nice expensive, you know, upscale bar taking the top shelf stuff of vodka and, you know, putting water in there and then serving it to clients. They're cutting the product. They call it soy sauce, but it's 60% gluten. So how is that soy sauce? It's gluten sauce. They do make soy sauce that's gluten free. It's a little more expensive. It tastes a lot better. Pizza dough, I used to work in a pizza shop like that, doing the exact same thing. You need gluten in your flour if, you, if you're a pizza entrepreneur because it allows it to stretch without breaking. Anybody who's tried to bake bread without gluten quickly realizes that it's frustrating and you have to be you know, 10 times smarter about it than just throwing a few ingredients together and waiting for it to rise because gluten is the glue that holds it together. So. The main food groups in the average American house, the standard American diet, is sweets, meat, wheat, and dairy. And a lot of gluten goes into our bodies. So I, I often say that by the time someone is a teenager today, compared to their grandfather, they've had more gluten in their body by the time they're 15 years old than the 80-year-old grandfather. Meaning that there's so much more gluten in all the different products and we eat so much more processed food, we're just exposed to it at much higher rates. So if someone has a problem with an allergen and you have it once in a while, your symptoms are lower. If you have it every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Pop-Tarts, Eggo Waffles, Wonder Bread, pasta, you can see how that could cause more problems for people, especially young kids. So why is gluten such, why is there so much gluten? I kind of hinted to it earlier. I mean, it's from a, from a food profitability standpoint, it makes perfect sense. It allows the products to last longer, it stabilizes them, they hold their shape, they don't break down. The gluey nature of, of gluten kind of allows the, the food chemist to make these crazy shapes and set it on the shelf in a package. You come along six months after they made it and you can eat it and it doesn't kill you, but it probably doesn't help you, right? And farmers get more money when there's more gluten in the flour. This is the market in action, right? There's more demand for gluten, so the higher the gluten in the wheat, the more the bushel is paid, the more the bushel uh, earns for the farmer. So there's an economic incentive for, um, for gluten to be introduced into our food supply. 
So over time, it's been hybridized and the percentage of gluten has gone up and up and up. I, I haven't looked up the reference, but I heard that the, the amount of gluten in wheat has gone up you know, dozens and dozens of times. So it maybe was one or 2%, but now it's about 15% by weight. So a lot more gluten is coming down the pipe. This was a slide I was looking for. So this, this report came out, this was published in 2013. It's a peer-reviewed medical journal, uh, you know, biomedical research journal. It's been published in uh, PubMed. And it, it, it's an interesting study. And what it shows, what you're looking at, is a black line going up. You, everybody can see that black line. The black line is the amount or the tonnage or the amount of gallons of glyphosate of, a, of Roundup being used in our crops in this country, okay? The yellow bars are the incidences of celiac disease, which is the most famous gluten disease, if you will, but by, by all means not the only one. So I am not a statistician, and I can't say that it's 100% correlated or causative, but that's correlation, right? You see a line going up with the more Roundup is sprayed, and the more celiac disease there is. So the theory is this. GMO crops, lots of Roundup, processed into a bread product or pasta, eaten by a person. That Roundup is a, is a, it's something your body recognizes as a toxin, so it's going to create inflammation to try to remove it. So if you're ingesting products with this Roundup in there, and it goes into your intestines, you're going to have inflammation in your intestines, and all celiac disease is, in its simplest form is an autoimmune inflammation of the intestines. So glyphosate may be a key contributor to obesity, which we have a problem with in our country. Autism, we have a problem with in our country. As well as several other diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, infertility, depression, and cancer. So peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journals are saying what you know, natural doctors have been saying for a long time. Going organic is just a smart, going local, going organic, don't eat food that's been sprayed with that crap. It's, it's, it's dangerous. So when I was, as, as research into gluten has uh, kind of come forward, there is some evidence to say that where your ancestors are from determines how much gluten affects you. In other words, People from different parts of the world tolerate gluten in different ways. And our archaeologists, the best they can say is that wheat started growing in that part of the world, the part that's a mess right now, Syria and Iraq. That's the first place that evidence shows that wheat existed on this planet. We all learned that in high school or middle school. So this group of people in the Fertile Crescent, they've been exposed to gluten longer than people in Northern Ireland or Scotland or Denmark, Norway, Northern Europe. Because wheat wasn't grown there 5,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. It's been grown there shorter. So the blonder your hair and the bluer your eyes, if you're from the Northern European descent, there's a higher rate of reaction to gluten. Okay? Because people in this part of the world, in the Fertile Crescent, if they had a reaction to gluten, they didn't pass their genes on. They've had 5,000 years to sort out who gets infertile from gluten and who doesn't. So the people with the gluten gene who really can't tolerate it are less likely to have a bigger family, less likely to have children. Unfortunately, that's kind of how it has played out over time. So that's the, that's the idea. So not everyone has the same reaction to gluten, but that part of the world tolerates it better and the more northern and western European you are, the odds are you have a bigger issue with it. I mean, even in Italy, where pasta is a way of life, there's plenty of people with celiac disease and gluten problems. So we kind of touched on where it comes from. But how can it be a problem? I mean, how, how is it that this thing that historically, even biblically, uh, can be a, such a problem for our health? And that's, that's where we're going to go next. I grew up thinking whole wheat was good food, but it's not really that. It's not really true anymore. Uh, the book uh, Wheat Belly, if anybody's read that, talks about how eating one slice of wheat bread, whole wheat, 
will raise your blood sugar more than eating a Snickers bar. Okay? So there's no, there's no evidence to say that whole wheat really helps much. There's a little more fiber in whole wheat, so you can make the argument that maybe it lowers your cholesterol a little better, but that's a whole other bag of worms. Gluten is a problem because it stimulates your immune system. Your body, your body has a beautiful system that keeps you healthy. It kills viruses, bacteria. It removes old cells when they need to be changed out and swapped out for a new one. It repairs, but it also fights invaders. And that's a very powerful system. So we can't really understand what gluten is until we really get an appreciation for the tool set that your body has to fight something like, uh, like gluten. So the immune system is capable of removing a bacteria from you, a virus, a cancer-infected cell. It's in, every time you have pain, every time you have inflammation, you have soreness, you're feeling the immune system involved in some way. So your immune system makes inflammation. It's kind of part of, it's kind of what it does. So if anybody's ever remodeled their house, there's a demolition aspect a cleanup and a, and a remodel, right? So your immune system does the demo part, okay? Other parts of your body do the cleanup. But when you have uh, a problem with gluten, you have 70% of your immune system in your digestive system. So 70% seven, of all the cells, if you, if you added up all your, all your white blood cells, counted them, and put them into a category of where do they live, 70% of them live in your gut. It's 26 feet long. It's a big surface area. It's like half of a badminton court. You, you know, that's a lot of surface area. So, if we upset something in our digestive system, you've upset 70% of your demolition squad, and you have 70% of that, you know, that that ability to create inflammation getting turned on and activated. And what your immune system does is a lot like what soldiers would do at a fort or a, or a base. They make sure everybody coming in is supposed to be there, and if not, they have the tools to make sure they don't come in. Well your, well, your immune system does the same thing. It's always trying to identify molecules and you know pieces of your diet and things from the environment coming into your guts, trying to figure out, does this, does this thing coming down the pipe belong to me? Am I gonna allow it to come into my body? Or is it something that I need to stop and break it apart and, you know, immobilize it and break it apart and get it out of the way? So your body's scanning everything that comes down the pipe. This is basically the essence of food allergies, guys. If you eat food that your body treats like a toxin, your body's going to create inflammation against it. And we have all know people who have dairy allergies. Lactose is a very common one. Um, tree nuts. And so, what we know scientifically is that each of our cells, this, this little diagram on the upper left is an artist's rendition of what the cell of your body looks like, the cells of your body. It's like a fatty, two layers of fat, sort of like a fatty soccer ball. It's kind of how I describe it. And on the outside of that soccer ball are little barcodes that identify it. So your body says, this is a cell that belongs to my brain. This is a cell that belongs to my liver. This is a, a T lymphocyte. This is a B lymphocyte. This is a red blood cell, so on and so forth. So, it's your body's way of identifying what belongs and what doesn't. And I'm simplifying it, but that's the basic idea. Those proteins, it's like a, it's like a barcode that tells it, like a UPC code on, the, on all the products on the shelf. Just your body has scanners, it, it knows, knows how long it's been there, what it's for, and whether it belongs. Okay? And that's how your immune system determines, kind of like this guy treating this, the guy in the suit with the metal detector, you know, scanning, is this guy belong? to me or does he, is he foreign? And so the issue with gluten is that because it's a grass and because it has these unique bonds between the molecules that we don't break down very well, it never gets chopped up into small enough pieces. So it's sort of like, um, I've heard it described as a wall of bricks. So, you're, so the, 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 the pasta bite you take the nice angel hair pasta you like so much, you, you, you take that bite, you swallow it, and it's like a, each little molecule of gluten is um, like bricks in this wall. And normally when you eat other food, let's say salad or a steak, your body can take the bricks that make the steak up 
and it can knock out every single individual brick into its own little piece and then it can absorb that. But when you eat gluten, your body, the, the wall, the bricks cannot be separated into small enough pieces. In other words, you, you don't have the, we don't have the enzymes in our stomach and in our digestive system to take gluten and to dice it up small enough for us to use it as food. So it's just this residue that's left over from the wheat plant. It's not something that we get any nutritional benefit from. Again, it's not a nutritional component of food. It's a stabilizer or a preservative or it gives the food some quality that the maker of the food was, was going for. So the gluten molecule goes into the stomach and it comes out incompletely digested. So this, this group of these large chunks, that would be abnormal. If you ate chicken and it started out as a piece of chicken and it went through your stomach, it should turn into tiny little single molecules of protein, of amino acids. And that's how your body absorbs that. But gluten resists, is resistant to our digestive system. So it floats down into our intestines in these larger chunks. And I'm saying this because this, this will make sense in, in a moment. But that's one of the main problems with gluten. If we could break it down completely and totally obliterate all the joints between the bricks so that each individual brick kind of floated down, it, wouldn't, it would be better. It wouldn't cause as many problems. It has unbreakable bonds. Gluten is hard to digest. I'm, I'm, that's the simple answer that I'm getting at. We can't break it down. There's just two types of people. People who don't digest gluten and it doesn't bother them. And then there's everybody else who gets some kind of symptom. Headache, weight gain, bloating, hormonal changes, low testosterone, chronic sports injuries, I mean, celiac disease, autoimmune disease. That's a big group of people who are irritated by the gluten molecule. Now, who here has not heard of leaky gut before? Is this the first time anybody here has ever heard of leaky gut? It's okay, that's okay. All right, so a few of you, a few of you. Leaky gut, remember that term because it's sort of the new way to describe how these foods and environmental factors are, are impacting our digestive system and the rest of our body. So I describe the leaky gut like this. So we live in Idaho, we're blessed, we have a lot of access to the outdoors, and I like to go camping. And I really, when I go camping, I like having screens on my tent and screens where I'm, where I'm staying so that I can keep bugs outside that I wish to not crawl on me and bite me all night long, okay? That's how your gut should work. It's a mesh. You hold it up to the light, it's very thin, just like a screen on your tent. That's what your gut is like. It's only one cell layer thick, okay? It's a badminton court in size, but it's only one cell layer thick. This is like 30 cell layers thick, okay? But we can't rub chicken on our arm and get full, right, ha uh ha, -huh. because you can't absorb it through 30 layers. We have to have that thinness of our gut to allow us to absorb, but it's also the Achilles heel. Meaning this, so you have this screen and it's the right size and the noceums and the mosquitoes and all these other critters cannot come into your tent and bother you. That's a good analogy for when your digestion is working well. You have what you want on the inside, the food, the nutrition, and you have what you don't want staying out. That's a good situation. Now, what if your toddler gets a hold of a screwdriver or something and just kind of, you know, knocks a bunch of holes in your screen while, you, while, while your back was turned. Well, now, now you're trying to go to sleep and you've got mosquitoes and all kinds of critters coming in through these holes in the screen. The screen's still there, but now there's holes in it. That's your leaky gut, okay? Inflammation from the immune system, that demolition squad I talked about, when they get turned on, they're very strong and a lot of collateral damage happens to the gut and that fine mesh that you're supposed to have that lines your gut gets holes poked in it. So not only do you have food leaking in that shouldn't come in, you have bacteria from your body coming in because you're supposed to have bacteria in your gut, right? We have 10 times more cells of bacteria in our body than we do cells that are ours. There's 10 times more bacteria in it, inside of us than, there, than, than we have. So we need that bacteria, but if we have a leaky gut, as I've described, where this, this gut that's supposed to be thin and like a screen gets holes in it, the body, that screen no longer functions as a screen, right? It no longer filters very well. 
too much stuff comes in. Too much stuff comes in. Now, if someone has celiac disease, they have an opposite problem. They no longer have a screen, they have a sheet of plastic where nothing gets in. And that's what ultimately causes someone with celiac disease to lose their life. They die of malnutrition, okay? That once the intestine gets so damaged and it's, it becomes, the screen is totally obliterated and all you have is like a 20 feet of scar tissue. So there's no more screen left. So they can't breathe, they can't get the, you know, they can't bring the nutrition in. So gluten is like that toddler going into your gut and poking holes in the screen. Now, don't lose sleep over this, you know, it's, it can get better, and it does, because your gut regenerates every night when you sleep. Your gut repairs itself. Okay? Sure. So, so when we sleep, we repair our gut. And every three days, every three days, that entire badminton court, that entire screen is born again, it grows, lives, dies, and is fluffed off and starts over. Every three days, every cell that lines your gut from your stomach to the other end is completely regenerated. So when we go to the bathroom, most of what we see in the toilet is just our own, it's, our, it's us. It's our own dead cells. So that, that works for us because it's the fastest growing tissue. And so when you start to make positive changes to correct these issues, people often feel results right away. Okay? Your bone doesn't change its cells that fast. You know, it's a long process in the bone, but in the gut it's very quick. And so this slide, if you look up leaky gut, that's the, I've, I've talked enough about that. You'll, you'll notice, you'll see a lot of um, information that shows how leaky gut leads to food intolerances immune abnormalities and autoimmune conditions. So the big idea here with leaky gut is when you have those holes in your when you have those holes in your screen and you have the demolition squad of your immune system working too hard you have the pre, you predispose yourself to having some kind of autoimmune reaction. And autoimmune diseases are the third leading cause of death in the United States in the world actually excuse me, in the world. It's not something you think about as being a cause of why people would get so sick, but autoimmune diseases are a big deal and they're getting a little worse because of this process. So, you see these little fragments of gluten on the screen? And you see the little fragments of gluten on the screen? It's the same pieces. I've just taken them from inside of the small intestine. So this is sort of saying that they're, this is like a snapshot of the small intestine and down the tube. And remember, every time you swallow something, it doesn't mean it goes inside of you. It's just like dropping a bean and it's like looking at a bagel on your plate and dropping a bean in the hole. It, it actually has to get absorbed to become part of you. When it's inside the tube, it's technically outside your body. Right? Technically it is. So gluten outside your body, leaky gut, it, le it leaks in. And now you've got all these pieces of gluten floating around in your bloodstream. This is where individuality comes into play. Everyone is, everyone's an individual. We all have our environmental influences that have affected us, and we all have our unique genetics. But what I've done here is I've labeled these pieces of gluten with different parts of your body to give you an example of what happens inside. So your immune system is looking all the time to determine if stuff coming in belongs to you or does not belong to you. And if it does not, it's going to destroy it, blow it up, and that's called inflammation. But what if you're the type of person who, when you eat gluten, the piece that le leaks in is, looks just like that large intestine. That thing I've labeled large intestine there, let's say that that little sequence, that, that 15 little amino acids stuck together, looks 90% just like the tissue in your large intestine. So, if that happens to an individual, the body recognizes that that piece of labeled large intestine is, is foreign and it gets sort of triggered to go and find other parts of your body that look like that. So it sees the gluten, the gluten irritates the immune system, then the immune system goes, hmm, where else have I seen that pattern before? Oh, in the large intestine on a molecular level and then you get Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Or 
Small intestine, I've mentioned that one already. Person eats gluten. Immune system sees it, gets irritated, looks for that same pattern. It just so happens that that little chunk of gluten is really similar to the way that the small intestine looks under a microscope, and so then it tries to blow the gluten up, and then it tries to blow the small intestine up. Celiac disease. Does this make sense? So they call this molecular mimicry in the literature. Molecules from our diet look a lot like us, sort of. And if the immune system gets upset that something like that's coming in, it's going to go everywhere and try to find something that looks just like it, guys. Iritis, inflammation of the eye. Pancreatitis. There's a disease called cerebellar ataxia. It means this. An individual eats gluten, it leaks into their body, the immune system gets irritated to the part of gluten that looks like their cerebellum, neurons in their, in their brain. Then the immune system goes up into the brain and starts to destroy these neurons because it's trying to remove that, that signature from the body because the gluten got it irritated and the, the cell inside the brain looks a lot like this gluten molecule so then it goes into the brain to try to destroy that part too. And these people, uh, they lose, ataxia means you, you can't walk, you can't balance yourself, and you can hard, it changes your gait, changes your motor patterns. Um, and when you take gluten out of their diet, that inflammation goes away. Food causing disease. The flip side is food heals disease, right? If one's true, then the other's true. So that's, that's interesting stuff. Psori psoriatic arthritis. I know an individual uh, who, um, this individual is heavily involved in the natural medicine world. He's a representative for one of the best nutritional companies in the world, but he has a psoriatic problem, um, psoriatic arthritis, and if he eats gluten, he'll wake up in the morning with a bloody crack in the middle of his hand and on his knuckles. They'll start to bleed and crack. What is his body doing? Gluten triggers it towards the skin, the immune system over the next few hours goes around into his skin and starts to blow up the same, tries to demo out that same pattern, and that's causing inflammation and destroying his skin. But when he avoids gluten and does some things with his diet and nutrition, it's totally fine. Everyone with a skin problem has to at least rule that out. So I, I introduced that a little bit earlier, but molecular mimicry is what autoimmune diseases are all about. And this is why gluten Going gluten-free is really, you, if anybody has an autoimmune problem, they have to take gluten out of their diet. This means anyone who's gone to their doctor and had antibodies, thyroid antibodies, Sjogren's, lupus, oh my gosh, you have to get gluten out of your diet. It's critical. The research is really clear. You eat gluten and your symptoms can get worse. So these are some more severe symptoms, but people with acid reflux, bloating, even poor sleep, is related to inflammation in your gut. I remember hearing before I was into before I was educated as a doctor that nightmares were caused by bad digestion. Anybody ever heard that before? It's true. They just don't explain why. But if you have inflammation in your gut and you're eating food that's upsetting you, you have a release of adrenaline. Not because you, wanted, you mentally told your, your body, hey, release adrenaline. Your body just does that automatically. So one of the side effects of having inflammation is that it causes your adrenals to work hard. Inflammation activates your adrenals. You dump adrenaline. And if you're sleeping and you dump adrenaline into your body, you will have a nightmare. Or you'll wake up. Or usually both. Because if we can all agree that a nightmare is... If a nightmare happened when we were quote-unquote awake, it would be really stressful, yes? And we might all agree that we'd be full of adrenaline, right? So if you're sleeping and you're full of adrenaline, it's going to color your dream. It's going to impact what you're dreaming of. So just keep that in mind. If you know anybody who has night terrors or bad dreams, you need to think they have too much adrenaline in their body in the middle of the night. Why? And then we go and figure out why. But the gut's a big part of that. So... I think so. I think so because adrenaline is going to prevent you from getting into deep sleep. So there's four stages of sleep. There's alpha wave, beta wave, and then delta and theta. So you draw a line, two above the line, two below. Alpha and beta, yeah, you're sleeping, but you're not resting. You're not actually healing. You're just sort of 
halfway unconscious. And that's when you have real vivid dreams and you jerk, stuff like that. So I would say sleepwalking is like an expression of that. If you can, if you can sleep deeper because you get good oxygen and your digestive system is working, you're going to dream, but you're not going to jerk. You're going to be in that restful REM sleep. That's delta and theta wave. So I would, I would imagine that people who are walking around in their sleep are not actually resting very much. I mean, there's, I mean, how could that be restful sleep? You know? So um, one individual came into my office uh, recently, last year, and uh, he showed up just covered head to toe in a rash. Had gotten progressively worse for like eight months. Started in his lower body and just got, crept all over his entire body. And it was getting to the point where he was itching all the time. I mean, he's a salesman. He has to go out and make sales call. He could basically couldn't work. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes health problems have to get <laughs> pretty bad before you say, you know, I'm going to do something about it, right? So he shows up and we put him on a gluten elimination program and a few select nutritional products at the same time. And I'll share his story with you real quick. All right, we're here with Kevin, who came to see me one week ago with a very uh, developed and long-standing skin rash. And uh, Kevin, would you mind sharing with, um, with, with us here how your experience went on, a, on our detox and how it was able to help you? Not at all. Um, yeah, within two days after I started it, I was, my itching was starting to ease off. Um, the third day, I was praising your, your name because I'm not itching anymore for the first time in months and months. Um, now the, the rash is not bumpy anymore. Um, I don't have anything oozing like I had before. It's all flat and um, it doesn't itch. I'm, I'm excited. It's, I and me. Sure, and how long, how long had you been dealing with this uh, skin condition before you came to see me? Well, not to the severity it was when you saw it, sure. but it started on my legs about a year ago. About a year ago, okay. And um, what were some other side effects that you saw from the detox? That were um, 13 pounds worth of, I don't know what, gone <laughs> after a week. Um, that was, that's great. I feel good. I'm, I'm not hungry, and I don't crave the stuff that I used to. As much. So would you uh, recommend what we do here at Red Mountain to Absolutely. other... Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Wholeheartedly. Okay. So that was a good study on skin problems clearing up when you cut gluten out. And it didn't take very long. But I didn't just say, hey, cut gluten out and have a nice day. We did a couple other things with him to speed up the healing process. And I'll show you another case study that kind of illustrates that point. When you're getting healthy through diet and you're working on improving your health, there's oftentimes two things you have to consider. You have to consider stop introducing things that injure you. And that's where a lot of people get right. The other side of the coin, the other part of the equation you have to get right is you have to introduce things that speed the healing process up. Because from where you started and you've gone through this health crisis that finally motivated you to do something about it, stopping the insult kind of does this. But how long do you want to wait before you get back up to where you were, right? So it's always a, figuring that out for everybody is a one-on-one is -on -one type of thing, but getting rid of the insult, huge, have to do that, it's necessary. And then figuring out what's, what's been lacking that whole time they need to add back in, that's the next part of it. And that's what being in practice is all about. So how big is, you know, gluten, you know, I mean, Jimmy Kimmel, you know, haha, ha, drink your beer and pizza and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's funny, but it's, it's kind of not because it's actually killing people. Um, and if people are changing their diet just because it's a fad and they're benefiting from it, I don't really care. I mean, unless they want to study all this stuff and come to talks like this, you know, maybe they don't care either. That's OK. But gluten is a giant, giant problem. That's what I want to make sure I communicate tonight. It's really a big deal. 1% at least of everybody in the United States is a, is a celiac patient, has celiac disease. So that's 3 million people out of 300 million, about 1%. 97% of them as of 2011 are undiagnosed. They're going to McDonald's, they're eating pasta with their family. 
they're eating, they're eating pizza and they're getting sick and they're having other problems like cancer, heart disease, obesity, and other things that are just ravaging their health because of the process in their guts not being addressed first. It's, so what's that? That's four times more prevalent than ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. That's just celiac. We're just talking about celiac disease, guys, and I'll show you that celiac disease is like just a small portion of everybody who has a gluten problem. So I do get the question a lot, is celiac, do you have to be a celiac disease candidate to actually have a gluten problem? And no, you don't. Celiac is just a smaller subset of a bigger gluten problem. There's other types of issues that show up. Celiac disease is more common than Parkinson's, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and cystic fibrosis combined. If anybody in your family, cousin, aunt, nephew, sister, has celiac disease, it is a virtual guarantee that you have a problem with gluten. And you have about a 400% increased risk of being, having celiac disease yourself. So there's the genetic component. We'll talk about that some tonight. But it is a genetic plus environment thing. Genetics loads the gun, it's often said. Genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Well, we can't really change our genetics, although I'm sure people are trying to figure that one out. It's a lot easier and a lot more rewarding to just change the environment. Change what's going on in your gut by changing what you put in your mouth. So they did this interesting study. This was published in the Mayo Clinic's uh, literature. And they had a lot of blood. T uh, they had this huge stockpile of blood from servicemen and women that they had held on ice since like the 1960s, I guess, or 50s. And then some some doctors and clinicians went back in there and they wanted to compare that set of blood and match it against the same age, sex, background of people in the service today and just see if there's been a change in how the, blood's, how the body reacts to gluten. And today's young men were 4.5 times more likely to have celiac disease. Okay, So all things being equal, the change in the environment, the increase in, round, in GMO foods and toxins and chemicals has slowly kind of ground us all down to where we're that much more susceptible to a food that 50 years ago, it was much lower rates. So it's, that's all it says is that parents and grandparents alive today have enjoyed better health than their kids being born today. And it's, we have an uphill battle to fight. As a uh, as a collective, which I, I don't mind, I don't mind uphill battles. It's I, I always root for the underdog anyway. But to be healthy, we need to you know keep things like this in mind. It's, uh, it's just this this these pictures here are showing you sort of the progression of what um, celiac disease is. On on picture A, you can see these really fine like velvety fingers extending from the lining of the of the bowel. And that's, what that's doing is increasing surface area. The more surface area you have, the more you digest. Because you can only digest you know, on that surface. So your body creates a lot of that surface. And so that's a healthy screen, to use the metaphor from before. But you can look at B, C, and then D. And you can see that those fingers, those fine velvety surface texture goes away. Because the immune system is just demoing and blowing that up over and over and over and over and over again eventually just doesn't grow back. I mean, scorch your lawn enough and you're just left with dry, cracked earth, right? That's what's happening here. It will cause malnutrition. And this, is, this next slide kind of illustrates how when you have a problem with digestion because of a gluten issue or some other you know, inflammatory process, you can have all these other types of problems. And it's sort of a, it's never A causes B necessarily, it's A causes B causes C causes D, and E is why you're in the doctor's office. And if you just treat E and take something to make the symptom go away, you're going to have another symptom show up down the road when F starts. <laughs> and then, you know, G and so on. So this is a good book, Dangerous Grains. If you're interested in reading more about gluten, I recommend that one. Wheat Belly is a good one as well. But these are some stats from this book. Um, this was well, well, well referenced. Overall, people with a gluten problem are just more likely to have some chronic disease. They're more likely to have something that causes them to die at a younger age. 
especially thyroid problems, absolutely, hypothyroidism, major, major, major gluten relationship. 90% of all people who have a thyroid, low thyroid, have Hashimoto's, which is the name that the individual who figured out it was an autoimmune disease gave it. Um, but that's an autoimmune thyroid problem that really has nothing to do with the thyroid. It has to do with the immune system attacking the thyroid. Fix that, and then the thyroid gets better, works better. Lymphoma. So because the lymphoma part makes sense, because if you think about where do your, where do your white blood cells live? They live in your lymph nodes, right? We've all had swollen lymph nodes when we get sick, and that's your body appropriately responding and putting resources where it needs to go to, to take care of business. But in your gut, you have tons of lymph nodes, and they call them something different. They're called Peyer's patches. But if those lymph nodes are always working overtime and they're inflamed trying to deal with the gut inflammation, well, inflammation is a good trigger for a cancer process. So 31 to 100 times more likely to get lymphoma in people who, have, who are celiac or who have, a, who have a problem with gluten. So, you know, that's the evidence of how much stress the, the gut reaction places on your immune system. Liver disease, you know, 16 times increase. 80% of celiac disease children are not breastfed. Now what that means is that the mom, the mom's biology is not balanced. It's not as strong and healthy as it can be. So when the mom's body's inflamed, because she's eating gluten and trying to nurse her newborn, the inflammation and the dysfunction that comes from her gut and her body's immune system begins to cause dysfunction with the breastfeeding. And so then you can have kids who normally would be breastfed, they're no longer able to because the mom can't, the mom's body can't do that when it's sick from being poisoned with gluten. And so, you know, does that, how, how adverse does it affect that person's life? They don't get that good gut bacteria to start with and then they gotta start all over again, generation to generation. So, um, low, low bone density is a common side effect too. If you, if you have inflammation, in your digestive system, it's more than likely your stomach does not make enough acid. And although heartburn is really common and everybody in this room has probably felt it before, heartburn is not caused by too much acid. Heartburn is not caused by too much acid. It's a, it's a paradox, I'll give you that, right? It doesn't make sense. But as we age and as we get inflamed, as we get sick, it actually takes a ton of energy, a ton, to make stomach acid. Who here has more energy than they can know what to do with? Raise your hand. Okay? If we're tired, do you think our stomach is gonna make all the stomach acid that it can, or is it gonna make less than optimum amounts? Less than optimum. Without having stomach acid, you cannot pull calcium apart from the spinach, or the other food you're eating, or the sesame seeds, and then absorb that calcium and it's harder to absorb food in general. So getting your stomach to work right is so important for your digestive process and it helps you absorb your food. So low, mineral den low bone density, when I see that, I'm looking at a long-term process of not being able to absorb your food very much, not getting all the nutrition out of your plate, out of the, out of the uh, vitamins and minerals you're eating, and over time being very acidic. So that's really what that's what low, that's what osteopenia and osteoporosis is, is a process of progressively becoming more acidic and more depleted in these minerals, okay? I mean, as we age, yes, our bones change a little bit, but they're saying that people are changing, the bones are changing faster than age would, would explain, and that's the explanation. But this is, these are some of the things that go under the gluten problem. Gallbladder disease, hypothyroidism, lupus, migraines, MS, tooth decay, dental problems, seizures, schizophrenia. There's research coming out saying that in people who have, you know, psychosis, they're finding that the immune system is triggering it when, when, they eat, when they eat gluten, the immune system triggers this inflammation that affects the brain so much that they have an episode. So there's a lot of uh, data coming out showing the connection between gluten and all these different things. So this is why going gluten-free has almost no downside. You're not going, there is not an individual 
who's going to go gluten free who's going to miss some nutrients it's just it's just there's nothing all the foods that contain gluten can be replaced with other foods that are in all basically in every measure as good if not more healthy for you convenience convenience kills doesn't it it's you know i'm i'm a we have a young family and, and infertility is a topic that we we come across in our life and certainly in my practice and if a woman is if a woman or man or both have problems with gluten you're going to see difficulty with pregnancy because the inflammation the lack of vitamins the lack of nutrition is a perfect storm to make pregnancy very difficult uh growing a human a person from scratch requires not just an average amount of vitamins it probably requires a little more can we all agree and if you have a problem absorbing them you're going to struggle and so uh i think getting it right from the start makes a lot of sense so if someone has an issue with gluten going gluten free before you start your family will probably help you and your kids and everybody be a little stronger and have a few fewer ear infections i had a child in uh had a 3 week old in 2 days ago who had an ear infection at 10 days old okay and they get they mom didn't want to but really the only option was to do antibiotics at least that was what she was told and so then the kid developed acid reflux after that so for the last 2 weeks poor guys you know projectile vomiting and acid reflux well we were able to test the mom and the baby for food sensitivities and wouldn't you know it they have a problem with gluten and so it was only yesterday that that child was in so I don't have follow up yet but a lot of ear infections come from the gut so if you have this screen down here that gets holes blown in it and all this bacteria leaks into your body well bacteria is going to get pumped by your heart all over your body and it's going to go into the middle ear where it can set up shop it's nice and warm and moist it's a great place to grow and start a family and it's hard for your immune system to get in there and get after it so a lot of ear infections and these typical childhood problems are really not that typical for healthy people for healthy kids it see i we have this issue with how common dysfunction is we forget what normal is we have no we we don't have a barometer to what normal is because everyone we know or many people we know as a society as a whole have all these problems and so i just don't believe that that's the way it, it was intended to be and when i meet people who do it who are healthy i see we'll see there's your proof that you know they were sick and they got better and it's not just a roulette you're not just born lucky you have to work for it and that's what going gluten free is it's a little bit of extra work it's thinking ahead cuz you can't drive home when you're hungry and go I'll just stop by I'll just stop off and get something on my way home well the person who owns a restaurant and cooks the food could really care less about your dietary needs they have a uh you know a number they have to hit on their sales and they they just sell food that's easy and to make and convenient and we've all been there so bone mineral density it's a problem with people who have a gluten issue it interferes with digestion it interferes with the absorption of these nutrients uh cardiovascular disease risk is increased as well again more inflammation in your gut means more inflammation everywhere and your heart doesn't just say i'm only going to pump the blood from my arms into my brain it pumps the whole system every couple minutes all the way through. So if something if you're getting like inflammation in your gut, it gets pumped into your brain, it gets pumped into your liver, it gets pumped everywhere. So what happens in your gut affects your brain almost directly. And it's there's a really it's really interesting how closely aligned those two parts of your body are. So there's one more one more uh quick video here. Okay, we're here with Cindy who has just uh, done a detox with us and been doing some work for um some bowel and digestive uh problems. Now Cindy, would you just uh tell everyone what you were going through before you first came in to see me? Well, I came in to see you because I have celiac and a lot of the symptoms I was having was severe itching from food, um bloating and just feeling awful. and i came to see you and went through your program and feel like a different person my bloating's gone my itching zero itching and i'm starting to get my energy back and it's uh been a great experience that's great would you recommend um what what you've gone through here in our office to other patients i would highly recommend what i've gone through here with you so what's interesting about her case is that for 5 years 
She's been gluten free 100% before she came into my office. Okay? So she lived 40 years eating a poison that was slowly killing her. Gluten. She's, that, that, was, that was her, that was the course that she took in life, right? And then she, she had this, she finally found out that, oh my gosh, I'm having an autoimmune reaction to gluten and it's slowly destroying my health. So she cut it out completely. Five years later, she's in my office and says, doctor, I still am bloated. I still itch. And what's going on? Why is this still happening? I'm gluten free. And so we go back to that comment I made earlier about the first part is figuring out what you have to remove. She did that part perfectly. She got rid of gluten. The second part is what do you need to add back in to make the change? It's often not just, it's not, it's not always easy enough just to stop. You know, it's good. It's, you have to stop poisoning yourself, but then you have to rebuild yourself a little bit. So she did a detox process where we, we put people on um, one green vegetable a day. So you eat green beans all day long on Monday if you want. Pick, you pick your vegetable, but for seven days you rotate vegetables and you eat one vegetable all day long. You can cook it, you can steam it, you can use coconut oil, olive oil, you can grill it if you like grilling. You just eat as much of that veggie as you can. You can season it with good spices, it's okay. And then you, she drinks, then you drink a medical food, which is a, it's a, it's kind of a extra potent type of supplement that the FDA, love them or hate them, um, has basically looked at like they looked at a drug and said everything on the label is safe and everything on the label that the label claims it does, this product actually does. And so we put her on an anti-inflammatory product and in just a few, you know, weeks, she was coming in my office telling me how good she felt. And so that was the key, that was a missing link for her. Not just going gluten free, but adding in in high dose the right kind of nutrients to stop the immune system from being the demolition squad, right? To kind of calm everything down and help rebuild it. Because the, the immune system doesn't really rebuild. You need other parts of your body to do the rebuilding part. The immune system breaks it down, other parts rebuild. But she came in about six weeks after she did this video and said, uh, you know, I have some other interesting news, doctor. Um, I just went to my other, you know, my, my family doctor that I do uh, all my blood, care, blood, with, blood tests with, and uh, he came back out with the blood test and was really surprised. And he, came, he stared at me and said, what are you doing? You're no longer anemic. And he, she said, well, I'm not taking any extra iron. He says, well, look, you're not anemic anymore. She'd been anemic since she was 15 years old. So her ability to absorb minerals was decreased. And by restoring her gut, we didn't give her any extra iron. She didn't take anything extra. She was no longer anemic. It's a cool story. So you fix a gut, a lot of things fix themselves, right? So the question comes up sometimes, you know, who is at risk? Who has a problem with gluten? Who is this group of people that Jimmy Kimmel is interviewing and making fun of on TV? No. The gr this is a, s a chart. The green is everybody. That's everybody in America. 42% of everyone in this country has at least one copy of the same gene that every celiac has. So every celiac has a HLA gene in order to have celiac disease. And 42% of us have the same gene. So that means that what my mentor would say is, well, sure, gluten is a poison for half the population. Half the population should probably should be gluten free, based solely on genetics and nothing else. Twenty nine percent of the entire population in this country, thirty percent, have gluten antibodies in their stool. So if they've done thousands and thousands and thousands of stool tests through companies who test for this issue, and one third of everybody. Has, is having an autoimmune reaction to gluten in their gut. That's a waste of energy. Most people don't have to. Remember, we don't have an excess of energy. Well, if you want to waste energy, just start a fire every day in your gut, burn a bridge down, and at night try to rebuild it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Just waste all your energy. So this is, this is your proof right here. This is why gluten is such a big deal. Um, gluten lowers brain function, like, uh, you know, it doesn't just hurt the gut, it causes the decrease in circulation in the brain. So they studied um, 
untreated celiacs, people who are still eating gluten, 73% of them had a part of their brain that didn't get enough oxygen. So dementia is on the rise. It's now the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. It's Alzheimer's disease. 30, 40 years ago, it hardly existed. And they knew about dementia. It just wasn't that common. So our brains are suffering now more than ever. Autism is now one in 50. That's a brain problem. So gluten is sort of a brain poison. And if you think your brain is great and you like it the way it is and it's, you have brain power to spare, then eat more gluten. But if you feel like if you're like me and you think, wow, I'd rather be smarter and sharper and I kind of don't want to, I, I don't, I want to take care of my brain, then, then a gluten-free diet is, is, a, is a better thing for the brain based on that piece of uh, peer-reviewed research right there. So it changes personalities. This is from The Lancet. It's one of the biggest medical journals in the world. Uh, and some individuals, now they're using the word gluten sensitivity in the literature of 2010. They didn't always do that. It's been a big bait. They just sort of drag their feet and say, ah, there's no such thing as gluten sensitivity. There's only celiac disease. Well, finally they slowly get with the program 15, 20 years later. But gluten sensitivity was shown to manifest solely with neurological dysfunction, okay? Crankiness, changes in behavior, kids, you know, behavior problems. You're talking about gut brain issues. Nightmares, gut brain. Bad attitude, gut brain. Skipping meals, going into low blood sugar, gut brain. It's, you know, world peace if everybody ate every two hours and had a full belly, right? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that would happen, but you would really, you're going to affect your personality, you're going to change people's lives by making sure that their gut and their brain have the best chance of working at their optimum function. P kids, who have a, kids who have bad attitudes and teenagers who are, you know, have personality issues and uh, behavior problems, they don't want to do that. It's just, it's a compulsion from the, in, from the situation that they're feeling inside of their body. So if you can change the environment inside their body, you're going to change how they act, how they talk. And it, you don't have to be a teenager or a toddler to be that way. We, we're all toddlers on the inside, you know. We all have a little bit of Fred Flintstone in us, huh? Gluten, gluten can cause neurological harm. So it causes harm to the brain, guys. If it hurts the gut, it hurts the brain. That's the takeaway. If it hurts the gut, it hurts the brain. Children who were, you know, again, the group of kids who's, who are not able to breastfeed, and even moms who, who eat gluten are probably, there's probably some of that, I don't know if gluten is getting into the breast milk. I guess I don't have that data in front of me. But I do know that irritation and inflammation from the mother's body gets into the breast milk and that irritates the baby. I wouldn't be surprised if these molecules did get into the breast milk. I know that you know, drugs do, marijuana does, alcohol, lots of things get into the breast milk. But this study said that if kids three months old or younger were given anything containing gluten, anything at all, I mean, I don't know if it was once or just like, I don't know how much they got, but if they got gluten before three months of old, three months of age, they had a five times greater chance of having celiac disease. That's all they did. I mean, I don't like this study because they're basically giving people a celiac disease, but it proves that this first few months of life, oh man, don't eat any soy, any gluten, and I would almost say no dairy too. Uh, there's a subgroup of people with, with autism that they're basically saying is caused by gluten. Autism, they're saying in some autistics it's just caused by gluten. There's, there's just enough evidence that they can say that. Not everybody, but in a sub, subgroup of that population, um, it's responsible for some of the neurological symptoms of autism, which, you know, anything that makes an autistic worse is kind of a cause, you know? It's, it's a causative factor. So gluten is a powerful thing. Um, this was an interesting study. It basically said that in some people, people, with, people who are lactose deficient, lac, people who are lactose intolerant, that may be one of the only signs that they have a problem with gluten. In other words, their inability to process dairy is, um, several studies have highlighted the prevalence of lactose intolerance and celiac disease. Lactase deficiency may be the only manifestation. So basically, 
you know, you know people who are lactose intolerant, they also should be checked for gluten intolerance because that may be their main problem. And it's a much more serious problem than being lactose intolerant. Lactose Possibly, but, but eating the milk isn't going to do the damage that eating the gluten would, what, it was what I would think. But yeah, you know, you can actually take probiotics that help you break lactose down. But you can get, like, you know, cheese almost has no lactose in it because that's what the bacteria eats. And it's in yogurt as well, it has almost no lactose. So there's a lot of, a lot of dairy products that, that don't have that. But, you know, dairy is a problem because it's full of hormones. I mean, girls are having their period at nine years old now. That is a, we're like a, we're like a science experiment gone wrong, and I don't like that. Yes? Another thing is that in the U.S. is where you get more of this, like, more of this lactose intolerance. By going to France or somewhere else, you're able to eat the different milk products because they do not cross the pipeline Pas- later. Because I, I said, no, 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 I can't have this in the New York Times because of the trade and just cheese and everything else, right? Not those. So it didn't hurt me. And then I said, why? Why is that? Because I can't drink 2% milk or anything here. You know? They say just strip everything and get it out. And then you're left with no enzymes. A dead food. It's really, we really have bastardized our food supply. The, the, I've heard that before, even with gluten. The gluten that's grown in, in, in Europe isn't genetically modified. So, you know, if I go to Italy, I will eat spaghetti carbonara at least once. I'll have a croissant in France, but I'm not going to just start eating bread with every meal. And if I was a celiac, I probably would never touch it. Yeah. They're not, but they're not also putting gluten into every, every other product. Yeah. So you, let's say we have a tolerable dose of gluten and it's different for everybody. I mean, it's still a poison. Okay, we get that. So is alcohol, but everybody, you know, you can have a drink and be fine and live a long life. Drink 10 drinks a day, you know, you're not going to get there. Sorry to say. So if you're having the 10 drink equivalent of gluten dose every day, then you have a bigger issue. But if you have a little bit, maybe it's okay. But I mean, think about what kids eat. Eggo waffles, Cheerios. Pop tarts, I mean cheese. mac and cheese. Do kids not? You could build <laughs> the, the, the inventor of mac and cheese should be a billionaire because they are. So there's good gluten-free mac and cheese. We use that in my house. You know, I have a yes, sir. How long have they been doing that? The GMO. I think some. You know, I think it started in the 70s, and you know, of course. It started with the wheat, didn't it? Well. They're like, oh, we're going to feed the world. Yeah, right. You know, me and my friends are going to get rich while you get sick, and, and I don't really care about you. I mean, that's really what they're saying. But they go into other parts of the world, and people, where they've been growing crops for a thousand years, and they know how to grow them, and they're adapted to the environment, they say, we say, stop growing this food that feeds your family. I want you to grow this product that I will sell into this market. And I don't care if your family starts to get sick because all you eat is corn. And you start to, yeah. What about that early, early wheat, einhorn? Einhorn wheat, yeah. Is that? Well, it was a way to increase yield. So that was the first, like, GMO little, like, midget wheat that they created, you know, like a miniature. Oh, einhorn is a changed one? Or that was my understanding. Oh, I thought it was the original one. I thought it was. Yeah. I got so it yeah, probably is. And yeah. I wonder they if it's the one that. So that was the one they originally messed with. You know, so would we have less gluten sensitivity if we never messed with it? I would say definitely. So can we eat corn? I don't. Not have the gluten it's still, but it, I don't know. That would be that would be on a case by case basis. I know, I know of an, I know of individuals who, despite having signs of celiac disease, choose to grind their own, you know, wheat and eat it. I think they're taking an unnecessary risk. Based on you know, but that's my that's my opinion. So yeah. everybody's different. Yeah. That's how the um, the indigenous people developed eating corn, but it was the right corn. And I heard in NPR a few years ago that the U.S. sent them a whole bunch of GMO corn, and they couldn't grow it. And the U.S. just said, "Well, sorry, we don't have to tell you about it." And then I've seen the change in the Latin American countries that. They 
they were never released before. You know, they could be plumped or trapped. Sure. But not, you know. Metabolically terrible. obese, yeah. And now you go and you see your BT more. Yeah, it makes you a little upset. You have to have a, you know, it's, it's a problem. And, uh, you know, in our country, the whole pasteurization issue, we used to, so when, when we moved into cities in the turn of the, like, 1880s, 1890s, 1900, people came from farms and they moved into cities. They didn't have running water. They didn't have a running sink. They didn't have a bathroom. The poop from the third floor was, you know, dripping down into the basement. I mean, this is really what happened. So you take cows and you put them in this situation, what do the cows do? The milk is gonna be full of disease and people are gonna get sick from drinking milk where you don't milk cows where people poop. And so then they pass a law that everything has to be pasteurized. Well, we've cleaned the world up. It's time to let that go. It's not necessary anymore. It never was necessary until everybody moved into a city and didn't have any intelligence about how they were handling living in close quarters. Oh, you go to jail in some con some some states. Yeah. Well, they'll never stop pasteurizing because it goes to shelf life by two months. Yeah. I lived on a farm. I you know, always years ago. I drink raw milk. Didn't have a problem. With it. Now I have a problem. With it. The sun will kill you. Milk will kill you. What else will kill you? Eggs. <laughs> steak. Ah! Yeah, but you know, listen to uh, your leaders, they know what's best for you, and just shut up and take your medicine, right? I hate to be that way, but it's kind of the way I feel. Uh, so, you know, here's the antidote. Educating yourself. And if, you don't, you know, if you're not a little pissed off about what's going on, it kind of, mo you know, what are you living for, right? You gotta, gotta have some motivation to go out there and make something change. So every person that I can, like, you know, reach and help them make a difference, then it's like, cool, there's one more person who's going to kind of not go with the flow because the flow is going in the wrong direction, right? Um, it's all about diverse problems in our bodies come from a problem with gluten. Not all problems are gluten based. So don't, want, don't, don't leave here thinking, well, the doctors, if, if, it, if I hear someone sneeze, it's gluten. If they have a fever, it's gluten. Not necessarily, okay? But in all people who I work with, who I encourage to improve their health and well-being, I recommend that they make darn sure that gluten is not a problem for them and if it is they get it out of their life because you want to stack the deck in your favor everything you can do that's simple and inexpensive and working with your body to improve it is a total win it's a win you can spend a lot of money doing blood tests to find out if you have an allergy to gluten people do sometimes people like having a test proof bam what happens when the test comes back and it's a false negative? That's a tough one. So the best, biggest medical journal in the world probably is the Lancet. They said that all you got to do to prove to figure out what your food allergies are is eliminate them and be strict about it. And then, after a period of time, it's usually four weeks, you add one back in that you think you have a problem with. And if you don't get a reaction or if you start to regress and have symptoms come back or your kids behavior improves greatly and then they totally go crazy again well then you have a you're having a food you're seeing the evidence of a food reaction don't eat that food or eat less of it that's how you figure it out learning to listen to your own body i mean you have enough wisdom in our bodies to figure this out it's just we've been there's too much like static and kind of you know false ideas that tell us we have to have somebody else Figure it all out for us. I really want to encourage you to, you can figure it out yourself. You just really pay attention to how the food's making you feel. But we're bombarded. It's so hard to, you know, just filter everything. Oh, yeah. The last one I heard was two to four beers. Mind you, gluten, right? Two to four beers will be, will help you with your arthritis. Now, how is that going to help you down? You're saying that the inflammation. Take the gluten for the That's just what I <laughs> Well, well, see, see if, you're, if you have a sore elbow and I break your finger, you stop worrying about your elbow. And then your finger hurts. <laughs> I think that was in the movie Major Pain, if you guys remember that. Um, Gluten-free heals your gut, stops autoimmune diseases. That's basically what it's saying. If you prevent the thing that upsets your immune system from meeting and coming face to face with your immune system, your immune system becomes less upset. 
If you stop irritating your immune system, it calms down. It doesn't want to destroy you and create inflammation. It's, it's fatiguing. It takes a lot of energy. So, you know, that's a big idea, guys. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it's key. It's key to understand that gluten is not just a fad. It's here to stay, and it's anti-GMO. It's anti-Monsanto. It's anti-Roundup. It's pro-good digestion, lowers inflammation. I don't see any negatives. I've been doing it for four years, and I wouldn't be here in front of you, grown a business from scratch, moved to Boise, start a family, if I was inflamed and you know had my health, didn't have my health. So it's a big deal. Who should be gluten free? Should you? Should I? Any person with a chronic condition has to give it a go. Any person with an itis. When you see itis, you're seeing inflammation in your body autoimmunity and any person with neurological or brain based problems because again gluten fogs the brain it kind of messes with blood flow and you want to get blood into your brain because your brain, your brain needs blood to get nutrients and to remove toxins and all that good stuff so this is just a this is a list of um, gluten free grains I will say this if you are a diehard in theory a diehard junk food addict who's addicted to gluten can very easily become even fatter and even worse of a diabetic by going gluten-free, just eating all the gluten-free treats and desserts, okay? Really what, the best diet for most people consists of lean, healthy protein. Wild-caught fish, local animals, animals you hunt, animals raised on grass, animals raised in a humane way. Chicken, pork, beef, lamb, Green vegetables, lots of green vegetables, especially the cruciferous family, you know, squashes, they're good. Lots of nutrient-rich vegetables that don't raise your blood sugar very quickly. Fruits are okay, but our ancestors didn't eat blueberries in December because they didn't have anybody in Chile growing them and putting them on a boat and bringing them over. Just keep that stuff in mind. You don't need that much fruit, but what you do need are vegetables. And nuts and seeds are also very good food. They have a lot of fiber, a lot of healthy fats. I was just reading about organic butter. Now, the key with organic butter, and the reason I say organic, is that butter accumulates all of the fat from that cow's diet. So whatever the cow eats, whatever corn or stuff they're giving the cow, GMO, soy, slop, I don't even know, you know, it's gross, it concentrates in the cow's fat. So whatever they're spraying on the cow's food goes into the cow's fat. Same thing happens to us, by the way. Toxins go into our fat tissue. Then, because the milk is a very fatty product of the cow, all those toxins are also going into the milk. And what is butter? It's all the milk fat. So you're getting a concentration of toxins into butter, which is why going organic, you just, if there's one product you buy organic, it just has to be organic butter. And now there's a, there's a type of fat in butter that is called butyric acid, it butyrates, and it's really, really good for you. So butter in moderation is great food. Coconut oil, olive oil, we have like avocado oil, you know, I mean, you want to be careful with, the, the, the issue with oils is you want to make sure you get a lot of omega-3s in your, in your diet. I eat about six grams of fish oil every day, just baseline to, because our ancestors had a lot more omega-3s in their diet and for most people that's a really good approach so fats are the most I, I, I think that fats are the most important vitamin that we get in our body they're the hardest to absorb and they're, the, they're easily destroyed by heat and light you, you've all have smelt rancid fat before or had your olive oil sit too close to the stove for a couple weeks, you're like, ah, this stuff is it's ruined. So getting really healthy fats is important for your brain and your, uh, and your gallbladder to work better. So, yeah. What would you say? Skin. Your skin. True story. Yeah, your skin. So when you see people with cracked skin, or really, really dry heels, really dry hands, even cracking, what you're looking at is an omega-3 deficiency. Okay, just like a, so you have house plants or leaves, plants in your garden, 
when the leaf gets, dr gets dry, it dries from the tip towards the stem. We've all seen that, right? It cri when your plants crisp up, it's the farthest part and works its way towards the center. We dry out the same way. Our hands and feet. So if your hands and feet start to get cracked and you have like toenail fungus that gets worse over like two decades, you're looking at changes in your end of your, end of your leaf, end of your body that it is going to be reflecting changes on the inside. So I would, I would always say if you have cracked heels and really bad, really cracked dry skin, you're looking at an omega-3 deficiency. And so if your skin's dry, the brain is dry, okay? And that's easily fixed. It doesn't cost that much. And it's a lot, the, the side effects are almost, side effects are zero and the benefit is, is big. Can you answer the question of what is gluten? Thank you, thank you, thank you.